Lifeline services are services whose functions allow the community to survive. They're critical to the operation of the function of the community. And these are the services that provide basic amenities not only to our citizens, but also to our first responders as we're addressing any disaster that may occur. And in most cases, public works agencies or our sister agencies maintain those lifeline services. Typical examples of lifeline services are transportation networks, your roads, your bridges, your traffic signals, your signs. And it's important, obviously, that those systems are functioning and operating so we can respond to the folks who need our services immediately and also allow those folks to be able to get medical help, food, shelter. Our stormwater management systems, if they don't operate at our full efficiency, we can't get to people and it's up to us to restore those services. Another thing that becomes an issue with, a, with a stormwater systems is if there's a hazardous materials incident and that stuff gets into the stormwater system, we need to be able to know how to get that stuff out. Solid waste, your trash collection, knowing, you know, every, everybody knows what happens if your trash doesn't get picked up over a period of time. You start getting disease and vermin and everything that goes with that. Water, wastewater and wastewater treatment plants. Potable water is very important to our well-being and to our firefighting gas and electricity. And in most cases, a lot of times in public works, public works maintains the first, but a lot of times the gas and electricity are maintained by a separate utility. From, in my agency, the city owns the utility company that does gas, electricity, water, and wastewater. When you get into emergency management, it's critical that public works, fire rescue, and law enforcement and emergency managers work together to restore those lifeline services. It's got to be a unified response. We can't work independent of each other. It's very important that we work together to, to restore those lifeline services for the citizens that we serve. Last year during Hurricane Irma, this is our unified command. On, on the day shift, we have what I call the top line managers because that's when our politicians are working. And this is, this is what is common, this is what we push for throughout public works across the country. The politicians, when, when, they're, when they're around, they want the directors, the chiefs, and everything. So this picture here is specifically, it's myself, our assistant police chief, our police chief, and our fire chief. And usually on our night shift, when we go to 24 on, 24 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off, the night shift usually consumes of, like in my case, it's the assistant director, one of the assistant chiefs, and the assistant fire chief. And it's really important that we all work together to make sure those lifelines are restored. During Irma last year, we, we were in command for about three days. And in command, that's when we're doing the restoring the lifeline services, getting those essential services to our citizens who are trapped. Once we get everything restored and people are back to pseudo normal, we go back to our normal daily functions and in the case of public works, that usually means cleaning up all the debris. One of the things that was an outgrowth of the hurricanes in 2004, when we didn't work as well together in emergency management, is the task force we created. And I think this has become a very vital thing. This is one of the things that, as chair of APWA's Emergency Management Committee, I've pushed nationwide to create these task forces. These task forces we assemble in Gainesville prior to the storm. We pre-deploy them somewhere where they can be safe. And it consists of, as you can see in the picture, it consists of a fire truck, a fully complemented engine company, two uniformed police officers in a police car, one of our crews a, that includes a tree surgeon because of all the trees and knowing how to cut a tree because sometimes you can do it wrong. And we also have a representative from the utility company because their motto is, if it ain't dead, it'll kill you. So we don't want our staff getting into trees with down lines when they may or may not be live, so the utility company provides us a representative to either let us know the, live, the line is live and kill it, or they can work back with their system to get the line killed if it's a larger component of that. These have worked really well. The primary purpose of these task forces is to work our way out from wherever they're pre-deployed, create routes to the fire stations, so the, so the EMSs, paramedics, can get out to the neighborhoods, to the police station, to the hospitals, and then to the grocery stores. In, in Florida, we have a large grocery store chain called Publix. They recently retrofitted every one of their stores across the state with a generator, so that after an emergency, 
It helps us because they no longer have to rely on us, who is then relying on FEMA, to bring relief supplies. They keep their stores up and running to the extent possible unless that particular store is devastated. So for us, it's critical to get the folks back out to those stores. There's, there's several different ways. I, I like to think outside the box and how public works can help with restoring those lifeline services beyond your normal everyday hurricane. Because in your hurricane, and not a normal everyday hurricane, but in a hurricane, you've got mass devastation, and one of the key components is returning our citizens to their normal way of life. That's what we want to do. We want to get those services returned. But there's lots of other things that affect people's daily lives. A fatal crash scene. I saw on the news this morning there was a bad crash somewhere here in the D.C. area. I'm sure it's probably a daily occurrence. And that will close a section of road because once you have a fatal crash, you've got a fatal crash investigation. So that will, that will affect that section of road for half of a day. One of the things we work with our police department and our fire department on is trying to help them clean up that section of road so that when we do open the road, there's not debris everywhere. And a lot of times people don't think about this, but one of the things we'll do is we'll show up at the scene, we'll establish a traffic control perimeter for them so that police officers, sworn police officers, can go do their job, whether it's investigating the crash or moving on to something else, let our staff do what they're trained to do. And as you can see in this example, we've got a street sweeper. In this particular case, we swept the street because there was glass everywhere. The other thing we'll do is we'll, you'll have biohazards, and there's no real good way to clean up biohazards after we'll work with the fire department to do the best we can to get those cleaned up. But you do not want to leave blood or some other biohazard laying on the ground after a crash scene. On January 24, 2012, in Florida, we had one of the worst total victim accidents in the history of the country. There's been several worse since. It's kind of, unfortunately, it's kind of like some of the other incidents we're having. Everyone's worse than the last one. We had, we had multiple fatalities on Payne's Prairie. The interstate was closed. So you ask, how does Public Works get involved in that? Well, Public Works provides a, a, a variety of services to assist the total response. And in this particular case, one of the things we did is we set up all the detour routes. It's, it's important that we help getting the interstate open, but we worked with the DOT in getting all the, inter, all, the, uh, all the detour routes set up. Then we use our traffic management system to reprogram the traffic signals along the detour route because I-75 is a six-lane facility. It goes from the, goes from the southwest Florida coast up the west coast of Florida and then to the north. And what's critical about I-75, a lot of the goods that are shipped up into this area and into the Midwest come out of the port of Tampa. They all come through this segment of 75. In this particular case, because of the devastation, the road was closed for over two days. Um, we, had, we had fatalities in both directions. Just a little overview. Payne's Prairie is, a, is, a, is an old lake that a sinkhole opened, and the water drained out, and now the interstate is, is at the lake bottom level, or a little above. We had a forest fire happen, a brush fire in the lake, and it, and it also was foggy that night. And so it was a combination of bad elements that completely obscured vision to less than a foot. And so we had a series of cars in both directions entering at 70 miles an hour and plowing into the series of crashed vehicles. And it was just, it, it was almost like, unfortunately, it was like something out of a cartoon where cars just kept going in and plowing into the crash. So we had multiple victims. We, you can see from the picture on the bottom, the tractor trailers lined up all the way that were part of the crash. How did we get involved? We, not, only did we, not only did we do the, the traffic routing and the detours, we also helped DOT with the repair of the road afterward. We had several tractor trailers that burned. One tractor trailer burned for over 24 hours because of the materials in it. Another thing that we did with our transportation system the transit system in Gainesville is, is in the Public Works Department, so we sent buses out there. Because with an accident of this magnitude in January, if you're familiar with Florida in, in, in January, it'll be really cold in the morning and it can be warm in the afternoon. So we had walking wounded on the interstate. This obviously overwhelmed all of our resources. So we used buses to transport folks who did not need an ambulance to the hospital for minor medical help. We also used the transit bus in the morning for those folks who didn't need to be transported but needed somewhere to be so that they could have a place out of the weather elements. And then as we moved from a, as a, from a response operation to a recovery operation, we then provided a bus during the day for rehab for the, first, for the other first responders. So 
police and fire could get in there and take a break out of the heat in the air-conditioned bus. So we played a role in that, and like I said, we were there for 24 plus hours. The road was closed for 48 hours in which we managed the traffic around through the city during that entire time. Pumping operations, one of the big things we get into in Florida was the flooding. We get a lot of flooding events in Florida. We're flat. Our stuff drains usually to sinkholes and then goes down to the aquifer. We have few rivers that drain to the ocean, but a lot, most of ours go into the aquifer. Our flood channels are usually fixed, and this is a situation where we had two subdivisions that were closed off. Our fire couldn't get in to do EMS work. So we work to pump the water. In Florida, one of the things we have to do is pump water from one basin into the next where it is draining. So this situation where in, to, in order to get two subdivisions back open to the public, we had to pump water for a better part of a day to get a pump down far enough that a large fire truck could get in there. Our fire truck drivers have to know how to get into places like this, but still it's incumbent upon us in public works to get the water pumped down so they can even do that. One of the things that we worked on with our police department, in 2004, this was the road to the helicopter pad. Obviously, they couldn't get to their helicopter pad after, after the three hurricanes went through. We had three hurricanes in Florida um, in 2004, and my county was impacted by all three. Somebody in our county must have alienated God because he sent Mother Nature on us. So one of the things we had to quickly do was restore this road so that we could get goods and supplies to our helicopter pad. Now, fortunately, they could get it through the airport there, but everybody here knows what security is like right now. If you can get stuff on the land side, it's gonna be a lot easier than it is trying to get it on the airport side, trying to get materials and supplies in through security. And so this is a situation where we quickly, working in conjunction with our police department and Unified Command, quickly created a temporary road until we could get the final fix done. One of the things with our fire department, we, we assist our fire department a lot on a more routine basis than you would think. In Florida, we have a lot of mobile homes. And one of the things that people do with mobile homes, I'm from Virginia, so this was the first time I'd seen this. When the roof fails on a mobile home, instead of replacing the roof, because it's kind of difficult, you build a carport over it. And then when a mobile home catches on fire, for any of you that knows, those things burn fast. So you end up with the original roof and the carport roof on top and it creates a really hot environment for our fire department to get into, so they'll use us to help remove the roof. This is an example behind me of, of, of a warehouse that was about the size of a football field that had a metal roof and a pole barn, wood poles, and it burned, and the roof just sat down on it. The fire department could not, had hot spots, could not get into it. We brought our track hoe, as you can see in the foreground there, with a grappler on it, and we would reach out into that roof and pull sections of the roof back, and then the fire department would spray it with the tower to knock the hot spots down. Now, one of the things we do to make this successful is we have operators in our public works department that are trained to wear self-contained breathing apparatuses. We've learned that it's more efficient for us, them to work with us, because our equipment operators are some of the best in the country. I'm proud to say that one of my equipment operators won the National Rodeo last week in Kansas City. I can't wait to present that to my commission when I get back. I, in my opinion, we're much more, much more equipped to operate our equipment than the fire department is, trying to teach a firefighter to operate a track hoe. So these are just the things we normally do on a routine basis to assist in unified command. We've developed such a relationship that the police chief and the fire chief both have my personal cell phone numbers and they call me on routine things. How can we, how can we assist? What can we do? One of the things that APWA, the American Public Works Association, released this year is our new first responder emblem, and we've been improving our relationship with other first responders. What I, have, what I feel is that we need to improve our relationship within ourselves, and we also need to improve our relationships with the other first responders and doing a better job. And how we do that fits into what, what I say fits into FEMA's 2018 to 2022, 2022 strategic goals. And FEMA's first goal is to build a culture of preparedness. Through the events we do in Gainesville, and I've talked mostly today about natural disasters, I've talked about man-made disasters, we've created a culture of preparedness. We've created a culture of incident command and unified command and working together. Our police chief and our fire chief and myself communicate on a daily basis, on a business basis and on a personal basis. I've gotten to know them, and I think that's a critical factor. 
it's very important that you develop those relationships in advance. Goal two, ready the nation for catastrophic disaster. We learned in 2004, we learned lessons in 2004 of how it's important to work together. One of the critical things that the task force was an outgrowth of was we had police officers standing with trees that had downed power lines in them in the rain that we didn't know they were there because we didn't communicate. We have worked to build that communication. That does not happen now. I want to get that tree cut. I want to get that police officer back on the road. So it's very important that we develop that catastrophic disaster. And that includes for man-made disasters too, like acts of terrorism. We need to be prepared. We had two speakers. We had a speaker in Gainesville recently who also spoke at UC Berkeley and the University of Virginia. You guys probably know who I'm talking about. They came, they brought a couple of hate groups with them. Public Works' job was to establish the hardened perimeter. We used heavy equipment to establish a hardened perimeter in being prepared for a catastrophic disaster. And it could quickly turn into a catastrophic disaster. 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombing are, are both examples of that. And then strategic goal number three is reduce the complexity of FEMA. I can't help you all with that, but those of us on the local level understand the complexity of FEMA and how that relates to us is we understand how difficult it is. I'm, I'm still going through reviews for Matthew and I've still got Irma to go. So when I get through with Matthew, I'm sure FEMA will be working with me on Irma. Um, but if it's that difficult for us to work with FEMA, in, in your strategic goal, to me it's important for us to be able to reduce the complexity to our citizens we serve. They don't care whose road it is, they don't care who owns it, they don't care which fire department's coming, they have a problem, they want us to show up. And that's very critical, and that's something that's true through public works departments all over the country. And with that, my takeaway for you today is it's, the most critical thing is getting our citizens back to a normal life. That would be the one thing that I would say. We want to get our citizens back to their normal way of life, going to work, going to school, going to play. And in order to do that, the most efficient way is if police, fire, and public works work together. Thank you. One of the things that's critical in that is Learn, from our, learn lessons from what has happened in the past. And then the biggest issue we're fighting now, talking about resiliency, is we're looking at storms. Because we are now receiving more intense rain in yep. a less time, and we're actually blowing the curves away. You know, we have yep. these standard curves we've used forever. We're kind of finding that with the storms we're getting today, and it's not a Florida thing, it's across the country thing, how do we build our systems to be more resilient to accommodate that? And I think in the end, that's going to be one of those things we end up changing the model we use for flooding. We do it by number of signals out, number of people without power. I believe that's what you're asking. Um, we report it that way how many people are out of water, power, and that way is versus other, other ways. And we keep a running tab. We use a program called CityWorks that keeps us in track. It's our work management system. It keeps us in touch with all of our systems that are out. We practice emergency management seven times a year, and we do it in a very planned stage. We have all of the first responders, including public works there. And that has allowed us to develop relationships. And what I've learned from that is that it's important that on a non-emergency event, just through the year, the emergency managers bring the police chief, the fire chief, public works director together, even if it's just for lunch to get to know the other people. But more importantly than that, what I've learned is it's not just, it can't just be the top, because I can work with our fire chief. What's more important to me is that my crew leaders can work with the sergeant or the district commander in the field. And so we practice that all levels, and we do it on several times a year instead of waiting till Hurricane Florence is about to make landfall in two weeks, and now I've got, to, I've got to deal with things. And it's important to know the personalities of the people you're dealing with and how they are in normal circumstances. You can only do that through either big tests, drills, 
or just meetings. We meet once a month. 